for many years, nothing that lived passed away. Life seemed endless as unceasing time. It spread across the incongruous surface of the earth. Men and animals wandered leagues from the starting place and bore children far away, children who did not know the voice of their grandfather and were not dandled on the knees of aunts and uncles. Some could not even tell a yam from a breadfruit. For many years, though no one knows why, the children of our mother and father began the practice of dying. Once begun, there was no turning back. Perhaps they had grown weary of fishing and of farming. Perhaps age and disease had sapped their strength. Or perhaps they were simply curious about the aftermath of their decease, wondering if they would live again in other forms or be transported to another place, if their minds and memories and sense of self would be the same or alter with the alteration of their state. Or perhaps it was the natural order of all things, fated from the start. Or perhaps it was despair that led our first ancestors to this ending of the animal self or the gathering effect of sin that, as the Kalins say, eats slowly into a man's or woman's heart, like water eats through solid iron with teeth of rust. Whatever the source and origin of demise, the souls of our ancestors traversed no space nor time, but wandered the bush without purpose or direction, their hearts tearing apart within them, as when a mother, on the day of a son's or daughter's initiation, shreds what had been that child's first sarong, recalling that, from this night on, the child whom she carried in her womb and cradled in her arms will never again sleep inside her hut and will grow every day more distant and more formal until he is barely distinguishable from a Kalin merchant who arrives on market day to trade a mat or shawl for a parcel of salted fish. That is how the hearts of the dead tore within them for their spirits were filled with remorse. Wandering without a home in the forest where no corridors have been cut through the crossing lianas, the vines and low growth, no place where the bush has yielded to a passing form except here and there, a flattened space where a boar had passed through on its bestial rounds of hunger and of force, drifting like canoes washed out from the shore without oarsmen, they looked back at the long course of lives spent in substantial form. They saw only a waste of vigor and resource, squandering of what could be held in trust or given or fostered. They saw histories of indolence. They saw mean acts without motive or fruit, senseless, unfolding from childhood like the petals of some poisonous flower, and they wept without a pause and beat their eyes and tore their skins against the pricks of nettles and cried out in articulate wails like the bellowing of brutes with the sickness that inflames the brain and makes them mad. The noise swelled out from the bush, across the cleared land and the savanna, across the desert and the foaming sea. Canto tells me the women prisoners have been transferred. I could see through the back window at the laundry. Maybe a dozen or fifteen marched out one by one between two columns of soldiers. But there's something stranger. Before, when they came in, the children were with them. Infants, I mean. They were too young to walk, and the mothers, I suppose, strapped them onto their backs or breasts with harnesses of reeds in the usual way. But now they were gone. There was not a child there, and later, when I left and could walk closer, I did not hear any crying from the sheds. When I was sure nobody was around, I looked through the grate on the door. There was one woman alone lying on a cot, no children anywhere, just her alone, that girl, perhaps my age, unquote. Cantau is 14. Cantau. For weeks, the uniforms have been coming in with stains of blood and tears that we sew up. We have been ordered not to tell anyone. It is not easy work, 
We can only get it done because there are fewer shirts each week. Two other girls and I do the shirts. Every week there are 12 or 15 less. This week we were down almost 30 shirts. It was a relief for us. Do you know of any troops transferring out? No, she stopped. The three of us, we suppose they were killed. Or perhaps they deserted. They have been doing that, some of them. From what Kantau says, nearly 100 Songari foot soldiers disappeared in the past month. No one noticed. But now two European officers are gone. G is worried. No one is to hear. It is not to be repeated outside of the executive committee, but Gehinta tells me it is only the red men who do not know. Walk through the northeastern part of camp, near to the laundry and the kitchens. Saw the huts. One room with a lamp. Must be the girl. Wanted to go look like Kantau did. Stood for a while beyond the barracks and the garden and the yard for regimental exercises. Too much daylight still. Returned just now in the dark. Passed outside the row of trees that line the peripheral walk at a greater distance. Not in the line of sight from the barracks. Not easily made out from the exercise field. But as I thought to move closer, someone, I am almost certain it was Stanley, came down the central path from the barracks and entered the shed where the light showed through the small barred window. Waited for some time. The light went off. He did not come out again. Two men's bodies in the square today. Naked except fastened to the skin of their chests, the pin marking them as officers. As I approached, I saw that one had Paskheim, drinker of blood, written in Samotan script on his brow. Tiny, precise, the work of an expert scribe. Festival days, Kehinta would recite old tales, telling the stories of the origin of Homa, of the time before they were maid servants. She was a great master of them. The younger girls learned the tales from her. They imitated not just the story, but the style, the rhythm, the tone of voice. Sometimes she would take Garna with her evenings when she met these women and sang songs she could not sing at the festivals because citizens were there as well and many guards not only servants. Once, Kehinta recounted a time of famine in a village north along the river. The servants had planted, irrigated, weeded, harvested all the grains that sat now in the storehouses, but these same servants no longer had two hands full of rice or millet to share among themselves. The storehouses were guarded day and night. The servants went hungry while the rulers and merchants ate platters of rice with walnuts and raisins and drank millet beer until their paunches were straining against the strings of their pajamas. But most of the soldiers were drawn from the Jamude. They did not wish to witness their parents' death from hunger. They could not bear to pass a younger brother in the street and see the face of an eighty-year-old man, look into his eyes, stupid with inanition, or a sister like a tree that was withered, its limbs bare, fruitless, without flowers, without leaves. They broke open the granaries. Some guards went along. Others tried to resist. Those did not live long, but were cut off like gangrenous limbs. Young boys lay dead beside three of the storehouses. They did not yet have beards. When they ate, their mothers still wiped their faces clear with spittle on their thumbs. Tomorrow, they would be lowered into the pyres, and the parents who expected soon to preside over a marriage ceremony would instead perform the funerary rites. Three of them on the burning ground beside some half dozen servants whose little food could not sustain a living spirit. Three infants, two old women considered useless, neglected by their families, and one man who fed his children before himself and anyway longed to join his wife among the bloodless dead, wandering, as the Sangari would say, in paradise or hell. So the soldiers cracked the locks, smashed in the doors, 
the royal family, the wealthy merchants, what could they do? All their strength was in the weapons of these men. Some tried to shout out orders, invoking old authority. They were ignored. Some tried to interfere, physically attack the soldiers who now controlled the food. They were given no respect, but kicked like dogs. They limped away, hurt, whimpering, with sad eyes, like punished children. They thought the servants loved them for their little acts of kindness, some words of praise, now and then some gift, a small basket of dates, an old sarong, faded in the sun. When they saw the servants eat, they saw ingratitude. The distribution was precise. The guards waited out the same amount for every servant and every soldier and the families too, one half measure for children under five. Some argued that the nobles and the merchants too should have a share, but the wealthy men and women had already eaten up two-thirds of last year's yield or traded it for ivory and silk. Quote, we grew and reaped these grains, but look around you. Men with hollow bellies and rough cloth, women whose breasts have gone flat, even the new mothers, while the nobles and the merchants dress like whores and sung are cut, and are fat as pregnant cows when the grass is plentiful. They decided that the rich had long before received their share. The whole store was divided, and for a while the people ate and lived and set their hopes on the second harvest. The nobles and the merchants grew less round, their children became svelte, but they too survived. For weeks they lived on grain kept in their private stores at home. Sometimes old servants would bring an extra share. It was something they expected. But the second harvest did not come. The blight that ruined the first crop killed off the second one as well. You could smell it, like something sweet and rotten in the fields. Some people tried to boil and eat the grains. They puked for hours. Some did not survive. Now the reserves were almost gone. Once again, the people began to die. No one speaks about the officers. Everyone, however, thinks about them. Constantly, I'd say. There is fear in people's eyes, a look of mistrust and panic, like a cornered animal. Here they are, trapped thousands of miles from home, lured by the promise of easy wealth, then faced with a nightmarish image of themselves, naked, defiled corpses. I too have been affected. But was it any better at home? Dak Power at Ardna Grainer turning up on his mother's doorstep with a bullet through his brain and a note pinned to his jacket. Informer. Then to find out that four boys were dead in Drumcliff Cemetery because of him, shot in a raid, and that a dozen others were waiting for the order to dig their graves, including Paddy Hogan used to deliver us the mail. As boys, they'd been friends. So, then Mrs. Power was entirely alone after her husband working for years with the Land League and her other son dead in the volunteers. Of course, when I speak of hysteria, I mean the Europeans, the natives, most of them seem calm. Indeed, I believe that they are pleased with the event, as we were so many times when a dozen of the black and tans would die in ambush. The Sangari, this is rather strange, seem well pleased as well, though they are at as great a risk, perhaps greater than we are. Among the natives, I doubt that there is one who has not dreamed of wreaking terrible revenge on us for what we have done. I remember the way we used to talk about the British at home. G insists there is no problem, but during the day, soldiers are digging a trench around the outer wall and uncurling a fence of barbed wire, heightening the barricade and adding wire to the top of it as well. They have closed all the entrances but two, which are heavily manned. But does G really expect people to believe there is no cause for panic when he is securing the settlement like a garrison in the Great War? There is something excessive in this, something purposefully histrionic. The Gazette explains the rebellion as, quote, atavistic reversion. Evidently, this theory is required to account for the fact that the rebels have killed members of the military force that is occupying their country, that has murdered their father's brother's sons, 
raped their daughters, and mutilated their wives. One might have thought there were simpler explanations available. Of course, the propagandists at the Gazette would point to the treatment of the corpses. The Gazette insists that the two men were castrated. I did not see this. Of course, I did not really inspect that region, but I'd have noticed, wouldn't I? Perhaps not. To suppose that is our superiority. We kill them by the hundred, but we have the decency to do so at a distance. We don't cut off their penises and stick them in their mouths like cigars.